Welcome YouTube to another episode of A1 Agents. I have been super excited to get, uh, I'm going to call him the man, the myth, the legend, but because he actually <laughs> is a man, a myth, a legend uh, on my YouTube channel. And I've got none other than my mentor, Craig Wiggins. And I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions. And we're here in Vegas for his event. It's his five year anniversary. So lots of exciting stuff. Um, for those of you guys that don't know Craig, a little bit of background, he started his insurance agency from scratch 26 years ago. He grew into a $40 million agency, and along the way, he created his coaching program that just hit their five-year anniversary. And he recently exited to focus 1,000% on helping insurance agents. Craig, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, man. Glad to be here. <laughs> I've been super excited for this. And, you know, for my audience that doesn't know who you are, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your story. Yeah. I mean, like you said, I started my business back in 1996. Started from scratch. Really had no idea what I was doing. I had no education, no experience, no money. They didn't really want to hire me. I took their little entrance test and I scored low potential. So I really had to fight it to get an opportunity and uh, had no idea what I was doing. Didn't really have a whole lot of support or help, but man, I was just relentless about not failing and figured out some things along the way. And, you know, here it is a couple of decades later and it all worked out, you know, so it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a really good ride. And like you said, I sold earlier this year to focus solely on, you know, helping other people, and uh, and that's been great. This this part of the business is so rewarding. Working with people like you, man, yeah. I'm so proud of what you've been able to do, and I think uh, you're a great example of what people can accomplish if you just, you know, set your mind to do it and yeah. and go out there and make it happen. I was introduced to Craig via Facebook. Um, there's this community that you created, right? Transform your agency, mm -hmm. and you know there was just this guy that was always just posting things and adding value to insurance agents. And so that's how I came across him. I thought it was so weird how he would freely put a cell phone number <laughs> just on the internet for people to call him. And I didn't even, I purposely didn't call him for years because I just didn't want to bug him. Uh, but then I went to my first CWC event in uh, 2018 and the rest is history. I've learned so much. You guys are a big piece of, of my success and how I've been able to grow over the last couple of years. For my audience, you know, it's a mix of brand new PNC agents as well as agency owners, maybe aspiring agency owners. Uh, I would love to, let's start with, you know, brand new agents. You know, is there anything that, any advice specifically that you would give for new agents on the insurance industry, how to be successful? I know it's a lot, it's kind of a broad question, but what advice do you have? Yeah, I mean, look, I think a lot of people have they have very limited beliefs that hold them back. I think sometimes people, they compare what other people are doing, maybe within their company or their market, or maybe somebody else with another company, or maybe, maybe you like look up to what Nick's doing, and, and sometimes people, they really tr don't truly believe that they can make that happen for themselves. So I think the first thing is you got you got to believe. I mean, I, th I think that this business is an amazing business, the opportunity that it creates for people um, it's just incredible. It's pandemic proof. It's recession proof. If you believe in yourself, if you're relentless, if you'll go out there and just take action and learn from your mistakes, there's nothing wrong with failing. You fail forward when you, you make a mistake and you figure something out. As long as you learn from that and you apply it next time, you know, it's amazing how things can evolve over time. So look, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to kind of, you know, bite off when you start in this business, but that's the main thing. Like when I started, you know, there was over 100 people in my class at Fall State, and within 18 months, they were all gone, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult. From, the, the guidelines were very difficult, meaning if someone had a ticket, a claim, an accident, in five years, it doesn't matter what the rate was. We just couldn't write them. So it, was, it wasn't like trying to sell them value or anything like that. It was like they just weren't yeah. admitted, right? So you had to fight through a lot of that stuff. And, and sometimes people really get discouraged, but you know, you learn as you go, you learn that this is a process, and if you're relentless about what you're doing and surround yourself with the right people, that's another huge mm -hmm. thing, man. A lot yeah. of you, look, a lot of you have friends that want you to be successful. They just don't want you to be more successful than they are. Mm -hmm. And once you figure out who those people are, you know, the ones that don't clap when you win, you need to find another set of friends. You need to find other people that will help you level up. and. So there's a lot that goes into it, but just having the right mindset, I think being positive, 
being around people that inspire you to do better um, and learning from your mistakes in the beginning, that those are some really important things that need to be a part of what you're doing. Okay. I have a, uh, a question. This question came up. You have had several six-figure earners, Century Club, and Century Club is selling 100 items and or mm -hmm. policies depending on the company that you represent. What was the one thing that helped you take so many agents over that hump and to be, get them to perform? That's another good, that that's level. a great question, man. You know, a lot of those people, it's very similar, man. They come in and sometimes those people, they don't believe what's really possible and you start talking to them about, look, this is what I need you to do. Here's what I need you to say. Here's how I need you to do it. And if they will buy into that and actually make that happen and take the, take the action to make it occur, you know, it's amazing how it works out. So, you know, if you're in that position now, especially if you follow our program, everything that we teach is just the culmination of all those mistakes and all those lessons and everything that we learned through the years. If you will just do it, you know, and, and, and follow it and, be, and, and trust that this works out, we've had multiple people, you know, that they came from working on an assembly line or I had one guy that was a chef and the restaurant closed down during COVID. And when it opened back up, none of his employees would come back and he had to do something different. So he came and, and worked with us and he crushed it, you know, for almost two years. And his goal was to open up his own restaurant. So we supported him with that and gave him a plan to make that happen and saved his money. And it was about 19, 20 months after he started with us, he opened up his own restaurant. Now he owns that restaurant, you know. Wow. So, you know, this business is, it's incredible. People have to buy what you're selling, right? Yeah. Right. By contract or by law, they got to buy what you're selling. So it's not like it's some discretionary product that people can say, well, I'm just going to, I'll skip that this month. Yeah. That's not how it works. So following the process and just really being true to what we're teaching in terms of how you do things, man, that, that makes all the difference in the world. If you try to get outside that and maybe don't believe in that, maybe don't believe in yourself, that's where problems start to happen. Can you talk about leading with liability? You know, that's something that you guys have coined and it's been a big, big part of our agency transformation. And we weren't maybe, for the first three and a half years, we weren't bought into it. We were on the program, but we, <laughs> we almost like, not in our state, not in our city. It's like, they don't know our rates. You know, in Alabama, it might be way cheaper, so they can lead with liability. You wanna talk about that, and, and I guess the hardest part agents have overcoming the, the price? Yeah. Well, look, I think the whole, the whole idea around leading with liability is, number one, doing the right thing for the customer, right? Because if you're in this business for any length of time at all, you're going to write somebody a policy one day, and something's going to happen in the future, and their future is going to be dependent on what you did or didn't do when you wrote that policy. So we want to do the right thing for them. Most people are grossly underinsured. They have no idea because they went online and bought it or they bought it from somebody that doesn't care. And then that moment occurs, bad claim, bad accident, something that they're responsible for, and they got a serious problem that's going to you know, follow them around the rest of their life. So we want to do the right thing for them. But then secondly, if you just think about it from a sales perspective, you know, if you're a captive agent especially, right, and you've only got one product you can sell, mm -hmm. and you know the vast majority of the time you're going to be higher than most companies that are out there, right? That's, that's, that's just kind of how it is. Why in the world would you try to commoditize your product and lower coverages to match what they have, do apples to apples? That doesn't make any sense at all. If you're going to be higher at the end, you might as well have a reason to be higher. So if you come to me and you have 5,100 limits, and we talk about 250,500 and umbrella, and we, we build the whole presentation around that and solve problems for you, and I get to the end and it's higher, well, I kind of expect it to be higher. I'm, I'm surprised it's not more than what, yeah. what it is, right? Yeah. If I can get you to understand that and get people to buy into that, and look, people will pay more. People will pay more where they see value, right? Think about the kind of phone you have. Do you have a little burner flip phone from Walmart that costs 30 bucks, or do you have an iPhone or an Android? You know, What about people that go to Starbucks and they wait in that drive-thru for 15 minutes to buy a $7 cup of coffee when they could go down to McDonald's and get it for a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. People pay where they see value. Your job in this business, number one, is protect people, make sure they have what they need when that moment happens. Um, and then number two, give them the proper advice and recommendations so that they end up where they need to be and, and don't have problems. And articulating that value and having that conversation, 
that's exactly what lead to liability is all about. And the people that do it, and you've probably experienced, I know you've experienced this in your agency, people that do it, they have a ton of success because now they're differentiating themselves from the competition. Now yeah. they're not just, you know, apples to apples and, and hoping they're less. There's, there's a lot of times I can remember earlier in my career where maybe you were less, but they still wouldn't change, right? Yeah. Because you weren't creating a sense of urgency. Well, I can create a sense of urgency with you by explaining why you don't have what you need and that your family is dependent on that and you're basically riding around out there for everything you own in the trunk of your car and then something bad happens and some attorney comes along and now to take it all away and garnish your wages for 30 years. I mean, over what? Yeah. Uh, an umbrella policy that costs, you know, three, four hundred bucks a year. So to, for us, it's just been a great way for us to differentiate ourselves with the competition, show value, do the right thing for people, and end up writing way more business than the old way. We were just simply trying to, you know, make the policy as cheap as we could and, and hope we were cheaper on, and, and compete on price. Yeah. It's been a game changer since we've adopted it and taken it seriously. Because like I said, I'm a five and a half year agent. We didn't take it serious until about three and a half years. <laughs> and we just were convinced that our state was different. And I wanna, I wanna switch, our, switch to agency owners in the next question, which is you dealt with, you've helped hundreds, if not thousands of insurance agents, right? Agency owners, what is the reoccurring theme typically of everything people come to you for advice about and what's your advice on that subject yeah le leads and staffing those are typically the the two biggest issues most agencies that we work with when we start you know working with them one-on-one -on -one especially like in the program you're in and we start peeling back the, the layers of the onion and figure out what we're dealing with most of the time when someone makes a hire they don't set any standards or expectations. There's nothing, it's just, hey, you know, this person can fog a mirror, they happen to have a license, and now you get all excited about them and you hope they work out. And that's a terrible, terrible way to do it and causes all kinds of problems financially, culture. So you need, you need a structure, you need a system, a process when I'm making a hire. So if I'm, if I'm hiring you, right, you know, I'm going to do a really good job, hopefully during the interview, to find out if you're a good fit, I'm going to ask you, you know, about your drive. If you have nothing that drives you, there's nothing for you to get excited about, well, that, that tells me it's going to be really hard to motivate you when you come on board, right? I'm also going to take you through our sales process and talk about leading to flyability with you to find out what kind of limits you have and educate you on that to see what kind of reaction I get. If I don't get any reaction out of you after I go through all that, that tells me how hard it's going to be to train you to lead to flyability. So I wanna really do a good job during the interview process to make sure that you're gonna be a good fit. And then when you come on, you know, we're gonna have very firm standards and expectations in place of what we need you to do to make sure that you are gonna be a good fit over the long haul. And if, if owners would do more of that from the very beginning, most people, they get scared about hiring somebody because something happened and, and a past hire didn't work out. And they hold on to three, four, six months. They spent all this money, and it was just like a big waste. Well, you know, think about it like this. If, if I'm a lead vendor, right, and I come to you and I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say these leads for 150 bucks a day, and you're going to close 20% of them. And three, four, five, how many days would go by before you finally call the lead vendor? Well, dude, these leads suck. I'm not getting anything out of them. I'm not closing anything. Mm -hmm. You'd cut them off, right? Well, you gotta start looking at staff kind of the wow. same way, right? Wow. Like if, if, you're, if you're expecting them to come in and do these things and they don't, what happens a lot of times, a couple things. Number one, it's so hard to find somebody to begin with so you really don't wanna like, oh God, you don't want that to not work out. But you also like get to become friends with these people and you kinda of bond with them and you care about them, right? Look, if I'm interviewing you to be a, a, a quarterback from a football team, right? And we're doing that over Zoom or we're doing it in just an interview setting like you would in the office. And you tell me during the interview you can throw the ball 65 yards on a rope and hit a trash can. My job as a coach, the first day of practice, is give you the football and say, all right, bro, th throw it. Let's see what you got. <laughs> and if it doesn't go 65 yards, if it goes 15 yards and looks like a duck and hits the ground, okay, sorry, man, <laughs> you're off the team, right? Yeah. Think about your staff the same way. Like, put them in a position where the very first day, get them on the phones, get them, in a, get them in an environment where now they can add value and you can evaluate their ability. And if they're not any good, the best thing you can do, if you really care about that person, the best thing you can do is help them find something they are good at. 
They're not good at this. Let them go. So that that's the biggest thing. That's definitely the big. And then beyond that is you know leads, operations. There's so many other things that go on in the day to day business. But if you'll start by bringing people on the right way and build your team, because you you don't really build an agency. You build a team of people, and then they build the agency. So you need the right group of folks to make that happen. And if you'll focus a, the majority of your efforts there, a lot of these other things we talk about, and they come a whole lot easier. If you don't have the right folks, though, if you bring them on the right way, and now your culture's bad, and you just continue to repeat that over and over, it's hard. That, that makes it really – when we start working with someone who's been around for a while and really get in there and uncover problems, that's usually what we find out is that they have cultural issues because people that are there, they're all kind of mixed. Maybe they're all mediocre. Maybe they're below average. They're not really getting along very well, or maybe they are because everything's so cushion easy. Mm-hmm. And then you start putting expectations on them. They have problems. So I would just go and, and think about maybe the people that have failed you in the past and why and start inserting things into your hiring process to address that. And that's exactly where if you go to our platform and you watch the hiring process or look at the documents, that's where it all came from. It's like all the mistakes we made, we went back and you know tried to unring that bell mm-hmm. and create a process that would work. And now we make a hire, even in the consulting company, we apply the exact same process. And I know they're either going to be really good, and most of the time they are, or we're going to know really quick, and it's not going to be a big expense. So again, think about it like that lead company. You're not going to let that lead company just keep selling you bad lead after bad lead after bad lead for we're, weeks we're and months. We're quick to cut off a lead I mean, company, but not a bad employee. Exactly. It's, that's Why? so deep. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah, same exact thing. It's th- they're a tool to help you get production, right? So regardless of whether it's, it's coming in a lead form or in the actual execution of quoting and selling, if they're not performing, they're not performing. Yeah. And you also mentioned, and it's it's such a, I think there's there's so many levels to it, so it's hard to pin it on one thing, but... If you bring it, or if you are open to always hiring, and you you're not so fearful of letting certain people go, you know, like heck, I just recently let go of one of my top performers. Mm-hmm. Right, guy was on pace to make over six figures, mm-hmm. and you know, asked him to come back to the office because working from home wasn't working out. He refused to, and just like that. But you know, if I wasn't in a situation to where I was confident in the team that I've already put around him, that would have been, I would have, I might have folded and been like, okay, you can keep working from home, right? But I was like, no, <laughs> no, you're going back to the office and that's, and that's done, right? And that's like a small example of what agency owners face. But look, you took a step that a lot of people are not willing to take. A lot of people, they, they let their team hold them hostage, frankly, and they're scared of what might happen if they get rid of somebody when what they really should be concerned about is what might happen if they keep people that shouldn't be there. That, yeah. that longer-term problem is a much bigger problem than the short-term pain that you go through. Like, I fired my whole team when I was around $5 million in premium. I had someone that I should have gotten rid of, and I didn't. I thought I would just hire my way out of it. And everybody that came in, that she basically was like a cancer in it, and she infected all those people. Mm-hmm. And we're having a meeting one morning. I'm trying to implement something. And everybody has basically the same you know, thought process around it, same opinion, and... How did you know you were right, you know? Is it sometimes you know, where it's sometimes like... Sometimes you don't, man. You you don't. Sometimes you just have to go with your gut. And, and I, But I knew in that moment that it was going to be very difficult. We're sitting at a table kind of like this, and they're all like, you know, they got their arms folded and looking at the floor. There's no positive energy at all. And I knew where it was coming from. But at that point, it didn't matter. Now they all had it. So I did. I said, guys, you know what? Just get your stuff and get out, we're done, and, and I fired the whole team and we started all over, and, and the lesson I learned from that is the moment someone tells you who they really are, you gotta believe that, right? It's hard, and think about how hard it is to change yourself, right? If, it's hard for you to change. So trying to change somebody else, probably really not willing to change anyways, that's even, a, that's much more hard, that's, that's exponentially harder. So you're not gonna change them. Once they tell you who they are, once they show you, and, and you know this is not the right fit, you need to get rid of those people. they got to get out of your organization and, and, and just have people here that are bought into doing things the right way. And, you know, the culture dictates that. So you took a step that a lot of people are not willing to take. They're scared of what might happen when you take that step. So you did the right thing, you know, and, and that person can go someplace else. Don't ever let your team hold you hostage. They're, that's not, if the tail is wagging the dog, we got a problem, right? I mean, we just, we can't, can't operate that way. 
you've got to be in control and they need to know it. And again, the minute you find out, so I've got four or five people working for me and I know one of them I just hired is not a good fit from, I mean, like we have non-negotiables in, in, in our business, the agency and in the business we have today. And you violate a non-negotiable, like even gossiping, about, you gossip about somebody else on our team to try to damage their reputation, try to hurt them, you're gone. It doesn't matter how long you've been here, how much production you have. There are certain things that we just don't tolerate to try to protect the culture. The culture is the yeah. most important thing. And if you do that, it, it'll work. So you did the right thing, for sure. Yeah. No, I knew culturally it was the right move. And, um, yeah. Uh, but we're cranking it, man. You we're are. We're cranking it. We're we crushing it. You're this doing month. awesome. I'm so happy leading up to this week <laughs> that we're doing so well because <laughs> it makes me arrive in, in, in so much joy. So, Craig, I want to ask you, uh, what are you most proud of? Oh, definitely my kids, man. I mean, you know, I've got a 20-year-old and a 16-year-old, and, you know, that's what drives me more than anything else. And um, I'm def they're, they're both great kids. One just got a full scholarship at the University of Alabama. He's a junior there now and on the presence list and all that stuff. And they're both just really good kids. So I'm very, very proud of that. Um, professionally, probably the, just the impact that we've been able to make on other people. You know, and, and, and the feedback that we get from people that we work with, that's that's just been, you know, it's been awesome to work. I mean, you were already doing really well when we started working together. A lot of people we work with, that's that's not the case. They're in a really tough spot, you know, and, and now they're doing a lot better because of their, you know, interactions and, and working with us. And I'm extremely proud of that. So the professionally, even though all those years in the agency and all the people that, um, you know, you bring along, you develop, I'm definitely proud of all of that. Uh, but I guess recently, over the last few years, it's, it's really been the interactions with the owners and staff to help people achieve things that, frankly, a lot of times they never thought they were going to be able to achieve and know that you had a, a role in that. I mean, that's, that, there's just not, not much better. I remember when I, I, one of my employees, they, years ago, they bought their first house. You know, they got out of an apartment and bought their first house. And that was so cool to know that, you know what, if we hadn't pushed and challenged and develop that person to have that kind of success, that probably never would have happened. And I was extremely proud of that. And that happened several times through the years, houses, cars, goals that they had. Um, so that, that definitely was huge. But in the last few years, I would have to say, um, you know, working with people like you and others that were maybe in a little bit different spot and seeing the success they've had, um, along with, you know, my family, that, that's, that's what I'm most proud of, you know? Yeah. I was gonna. I wanted to ask you. Well, you've two things. You've said you've you've said in the past that if you get people to do things for you, it's manipulation. If you get people to do things for them, it's leadership. Leadership. Hundred mm -hmm. percent. And I also want to ask you. You know, on your way to getting to where you're at today, I know that you're extremely big and passionate about not missing the events, the the practices, the. Um, the recitals, especially with your family, um, and just not missing those important milestones and just, you know, moments, right? What would be your advice to those that are in in the midst of that grind, you know? Like you're a little bit, you know, you're, you're on top of the hill looking at everything that you, you know, how far you've climbed, and it might be a little easier to say when you're at the top of the mountain if Hopefully that's a good analogy. <laughs> I get it. But what would you say to those that are in that are in the midst of the? Yeah. You no. Know? Well, look. First of all, you, I mean, you're right. When you're first starting, there's sacrifices that you have to make, right? I mean, if, if you're going to be successful, you know, business doesn't care about your feelings, right? You're going to have to do certain things sometimes that maybe you don't really want to do, but you know they need to get done. Look, if you have kids, they're still look. We lie to ourselves more than anybody else. And a lot of the, the big lies we tell her, we don't have time. You have, you have a lot more time. You have a lot more time than you think you do um, or that you want to admit to. So when you have kids, especially if you have young kids, I mean, they go to bed at like 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So you got 9 to 1 o'clock in the morning. You can get a lot of work done from 9 to 1 o'clock in the morning. Or you can go watch Netflix and Amazon Prime and, you know, all the TV you want to watch or play video games. You can do all that if you want to. That's, that's up to you. But if you really, like, start breaking down how many hours you have in a day, beyond your sleep and your work and you'll find that there is time if you'll make time if you'll prioritize that time so even you know going back to the beginning when my kids my rule of thumb is very simple if my kids expect me to be there 
if they're going to be disappointed that I wasn't there, if they're going to look up into the stands or look out into the audience and wonder, you know, where's dad, then I'm going to be there. I'm not missing that stuff. And because I think I don't think you ever get it back. And I've seen parents, I coach baseball and football, and I've seen parents that didn't, they didn't approach it that way. And I think it's a huge mistake. They're going to regret that later in life. Um, so I'm going to be there. I'm going to make, I'm going to figure out how to be there. And I think you just have to prioritize your time. And, and there's a little saying, I'm sure you've heard me say it before, is just be where your feet are. You know, if, if you apply yourself, you know, I learned that lesson years ago playing football. I'm in line for a drill. I'm supposed to be paying attention to the drill, and I'm not. Me and my two buddies are kind of goofing off, laughing, cutting up. And out of the side of my face mask, I see this big hand come in and grab my face mask. He throws me to the ground. He throws my two buddies to the ground. You could do that in the 80s, and they wouldn't cancel you or take you to jail, you know. Now you're <laughs> done forever. Um, and he's like, hit it, which meant it was time to run. So we're out there running around the track while, while these people are in there, you know, practicing. And, um, you know, we finally get done. He blows the horn, calls us in, and says, and take, tells us, take a knee, take a knee. He's like, boys, you need, to be, you need to be where your feet are. And we have no idea what he's talking about, and he can tell. We're just too scared to say anything. He's like, guys, we're in your classroom. You study. When you're in the weight room, you lift. When you're on this practice field, you practice. That's good. And what he was saying is like, wherever you are, you give 100% to that. A lot of you, and I'm saying this to a lot of you watching right now, um, a lot of you have problems and stress in your life because you don't live, that you don't have any balance. You've taken your work home. Now you're not listening to your spouse or to your girlfriend or to your boyfriend. You're not paying attention to your kids because you're so preoccupied with what's going on at the office. And that creates problems. And a lot of that stems because while you're at, all, at the office, while you're supposed to be working, you're not really working. Yeah. You're doing other things. So you're not applying yourself there. If you'll just learn, be where your feet are. So when you're at work, work. Get off Facebook, get off Instagram, quit doing all the stuff you're doing that's wasting your time. When you're with your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, pay attention to them, put the phone away, right? When your kids come up and tell you a story, or something happened and they're expecting a, you know, some sort of reaction and you don't give one because you're not listening, that's a problem. So just learn to just be where your feet are. If you will just be where you are and be in the moment and give 100% to that, things get a whole lot easier. So look, you're still going to have to make some sacrifices. And you know, going back to the kind of my rule, like my kids, when they were four years old and had a birthday party to go to and didn't really care whether dad was there or not, did I go to the birthday party? No. I would work, right? If they're doing something that's, you know, outside with their friends and doesn't matter, what, there's times you can pick to still, you know, have balance and, and be there for the things that matter. And I think if, if you'll try to live your life as much as you can, and I'm, I'm, look, I'm not going to tell you that I'm 100% with that. There's times yeah. with technology today and your iPhone and the way you can get information, yeah, you might, you might glance at your phone. Maybe you maybe shouldn't be, and sometimes I'm guilty of that too. But I think the more... You just try to live your life that way, where you just live, be where your feet are. Wherever you are, like you're at this event, right? Today, tomorrow, you're going to focus. You're going to pay attention to what's going on here. You're not going to be in la-la land or look at your phone or checking. You're going to be focused on what's going on on that stage. And I think, I think that's probably the, the best way to approach things. And as things move forward and life unfolds and you deal with things, you know, it is what it is. But having that balance and learning when to pick your moments um, that's what can help you make sure that you don't miss out on the things that really do matter while you build your business. Yeah. And you've, I think the insurance industry is such a great industry because you know, typically we are open Monday through Friday or close on the weekends, right? And it's a business that you, it's always ongoing work, but as agency owners, there is the residual aspect of it mm -hmm. where you don't have to work as hard um, to get, you know, to grow your agencies. And you have been able to, I think you're like the perfect person to talk about that because, you know, from the outside looking in, I do see you're involved with your family. You uh, do things that make you happy, right? Absolutely. When I think of you, I think of Alabama football, <laughs> hunting and fishing, um, family first, but those are the second two, you know, things. And, and, uh, and you've also not only built this huge insurance agency, but for you know, five or six years, you were also, you created a startup coaching, consulting business 
And yeah, they're tied together, but that's still no easy task, you know. And so, um, you know, it's, it's good to hear, you know, that advice because I know that agency owners, we, we get caught up in this, in this grind. And I you know for the younger people like myself, I, you know, with how much I post and how big of a brand I have, it's a gift and a curse as well. So uh, two last questions. Uh, was there an aha moment in your career where things just clicked and things, I guess, when I think of Warren Buffett, right, hey, he was – he wasn't like filthy until like 55, right? And then it was just like 55, his, <laughs> his net, wor- uh, net worth like tripled, right? And I think maybe he had an aha moment or he had the aha moment years and years in the past, you know, like 20 years prior. And then he just kind of like, you know, snowballed it, I guess. Was there an aha moment in your career where things really propelled? Yeah, I would say, you know, for me, um, I know you've heard me talk about this at some of our events and things, but when my youngest son was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, that's really what, that changed everything for me because, I mean, frankly, up until that point, I was really not, um, I wasn't a leader of any kind. I was really just a, a boss and I was really a manipulative, really just a jerk to my employees, just trying to get what I could out of them and looked at them as, as pawns to help me be successful. And when my youngest son was, was diagnosed with that in, in 2008, it really made me stop and think about, you know, things that are a lot more important and trying to prioritize things. And I knew there wasn't a lot I could do for him other than get him the care that he needed, but I did have this group of people at the office that I could do a lot for. So it really changed my approach. And that's when I really started thinking about how to help other people get what they want and not so much focusing on myself. And it was amazing. I mean, when that happened, that was in April of 2008, in the middle of, of the financial crisis of 2008, um, you know, we just had record month after record month after record month. Once, once people know that you care and that you're really truly trying to help them, they will do way more than when you just have quotas and you know, things that they have to do. So that was really the biggest aha moment for me. And luckily we found out later that year that he, he didn't even have cystic fibrosis. It was, it was a misdiagnosis. He, he just had symptoms of it and he's fine and totally healthy today. But that really changed a lot of things for me. It just changed my approach. So I'm still a, a hard ass, but it's it, the, the meaning behind it is a little maybe different than what it used to be. It's really about, I don't want people to cheat themselves, cheat their family. I want them to, to get the things that they deserve. And we try to push and drive, motivate them to do so. And, and it all stemmed from going through that you know, years ago and, and just learning that lesson that helping people get what they want is that's, that's the best way to approach this. Mm-hmm. I think you said Zig Ziglar, help as many people get That's what they right. want, and you'll get everything you want. 100%. He's right. Well, uh, my last question, and before I get to it, I just want to acknowledge you, man. Thank you for, you know, all you've done for me. You know, if I didn't take uh, that step to go to my first CWC event or to get plugged in, you know, I arguably am not where I'm at today. You know, I've been a sponge, and I've really taken all your advice seriously, and I'm not the only person. Like, you've helped hundreds of agents, um, I see, I'm not the only one, right, that, that you've impacted. So really grateful for you, Joseph, your entire team and what you've built. Before I get into my last question, um, actually, here's my last question. So the title of this series is A1 Agents. When I looked up the definition of A1, it's to the highest of standards, the highest of quality, right? And I want to know three standards or qualities you live your life by. That's a good question, and and before I answer that, I would I'd, I'd say back to you, it's been awesome to work with you. It, it, look, you guys are following this guy, you know, you, you need to pay attention to what he's doing. He takes action. We talk about things. Here's a suggestion. He goes out and does it right, and that's that's half the battle. If you'll just take action on things, you always learn. You always have progress, even if it doesn't work out the way you want because you learn from that, right? So so many people are they're unwilling to do that. And you've been able to do that, and you've done a great job, and I'm really proud, and, and it's been awesome to watch you, and you can't imagine what you're going to be, you know, 20 years from now. Um, look, I think when it comes to you know, standards and values, those types of things, the main thing is honesty, I think, drives everything, right? If you're dishonest with people, if you lie to people, if you're not, if you try to pretend to be somebody you're not, you know, all those kind of things, they just cause you problems. You just, you just get in trouble, you know. And I think if you'll, 
if you'll lead by being honest and being true and um, being transparent about what you do and always you know owning things that go wrong taking responsibility for those things and realizing that hey it's not the person that didn't work out it's you're the one that hired them you're the one that evaluated them you're the one that thought they were going to work out they didn't work out that's that's not their fault that's your fault you're the one that, that made that decision and when you start owning those kind of things and being honest with yourself um, you know that's huge and I think just putting that ahead of everything else and really truly trying to help other people get what they want whether it's a you know employee another another a customer a friend whoever if you always try to help other people get what they want and sometimes it could just be a short conversation you know with something that they're struggling with those kind of things make a big difference for people and, and in a way can kind of come back and help you too a lot of times it's, it's funny how that works sometimes you help other people it comes back and it helps you um, but but honesty putting people first and then I think you just got to be really disciplined to yourself too. You got to do the things that you know need to get done even when you don't feel like doing them. And that's that's a hard thing for a lot of people. We you get so, especially in our business, you know, so autonomous. And a lot of things you do, they're, they're up to you, you whether you do it or you don't do it. There's nobody standing over your shoulder making you <laughs> doing it, right? But I'm a firm believer that everybody's exactly where they are because of the choices and decisions they've made in their life. And you think about where you are right now, a lot of what's going on now is because of the things you decided to do last year, the year before, five years ago. So the things you're doing today, the decisions and choices you're making today, that's ultimately gonna determine where you are three, four, five, ten years from now. So owning all of that and, and just having some responsibility for it and, and just being honest with yourself and with other people um, while you help other people, I, I think that, it's hard to go wrong with that, you know, and, and then bad things will happen. Things will, things won't work out the way you want them to sometimes, but you just learn from that, you know, and I think the sooner you understand all that stuff is just part of the process to get where you want to go, you know, focus on the stuff you can control. Don't worry about the things you can't control. Focus on the choices and decisions you can make that make a difference for, you know, whatever you're dealing with in the moment or something that might happen, might matter five years from now. If you, if you stay in, in that area, um, I, I think you'll turn out just fine. I think you'll do really well. I love those three. I smirked at a couple of them just because they resonate, and I could think of so many things as you <laughs> as you say that stuff, as you say your your top three. So, uh, well, Craig, I appreciate you, brother. Uh, if people wanted to connect with you, you can find him on Facebook, Craig Wiggins. I know you've got a YouTube channel as well mm -hmm. where you drop a lot of value there. You've got Facebook communities, right? Mm -hmm. Transform your agency. Uh, Craig Wiggins coaching, mm -hmm. right? So if you guys want to connect and be a part of a really good community, um, I highly recommend you get plugged into those Facebook groups. Uh, if you want additional coaching, you can sign up for his platform where there are how many videos? Oh, thousands now, hours and hours of content. Hours of content. I make my team watch it every day. Um, and so I can't say enough good things about it and how helpful it is to training your team. But it's not just setting it and forgetting it, it's holding your team accountable to mm -hmm. watching this, the content and then, you know, role playing and putting it into action. So there's a lot to it, but um, I'll make sure that I have all that information uh, in the show notes. And you also get a really awesome discount code by using uh, my link uh, that mm -hmm. I'll put in the show notes as well. So Craig, um, I appreciate you, brother. Thank Absolutely, you so much man. for doing this. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Proud of you, man. Keep up the great work. I will. Thank you.